Okay, hello. So the first talk is about AWS Cloud Van. My first question is, does anyone use it already? So one, two people. Okay, so fairly beginners here. So the agenda for today will be some kind of introduction first. So we all know what it is, what it can provide. Then we will uh, talk about the building blocks, how you can actually build your own cloud van, what you need, uh, maybe even how it's priced. So you will learn all of that. Then I will show you the user interface, which is basically, I think, one of the few AWS user interfaces that's actually good. <laughs> Sorry, guys. But this one is really, really useful. You can debug a lot of things. You have a lot of amazing information, and you can really operate the whole thing from here. Uh, then I will show you the basics, how to deploy uh, your first cloud van, some basics, and how to maybe operate it, edit it, modify it. And as a last thing, I will describe how Atacama actually got into CloudVan, what were the challenges, and what, how it was solved by actually this amazing technology. Uh, first, a bit about me. My name is Daniel Pospíšel. Uh, I have over 14 years experience of infrastructure, mainly networks and Linux infrastructure. And over those two last years, I spent in Atacama, where uh, for the last six months, I am the internal network and SecOps lead. And I, can, uh, I would like to emphasize it internal use. This, my, my talk is about our internal use only. The customers and maybe developers will follow. They are not there yet. And so all what you will hear from me, it's about the internal usage of that. And as you see, uh, there is a shisha down there. And basically, I'm a shisha lover. So anytime, if you would like to talk to me, go to Caviar. I will be there. <laughs> so let's start with the introduction. So what is Cloud Van? Basically, the description is easy. It's managed global network. For, let's say, the on-prem guys, it's layer 3 IP VPN over MPLS. So if you know that, you can go home, that you will learn nothing new. But if you don't, <laughs> you can stay, of course. So the, as I mentioned, there is a central dashboard for management. So basically, all the information, all the configuration from all regions, even connections to outside world are in one dashboard. You can troubleshoot it from there. Uh, you can update it, edit it. I will show you more. Uh, there is one cool thing why we even went for it. It's the segmentation by design. So basically, you don't have to worry much about separating your array of concerns. You can really easily say, I don't know, for example, this is the internal IT segment and whatever goes there will stay in that segment. There is no communication to any other segment or even internet, which is, I will describe how we use it more later. Uh, everything is managed by policy. Uh, that's, you can imagine it as a JSON file, which is describing what can communicate with what, uh, all the segmentation, what regions are you using. I will show again more examples later. Uh, about the metrics, the throughput is really similar to transit gateways. So for example, the 50 gigabit per VPC, I think is more than enough for normal usage for anybody. So we didn't hit any obstacles at all while we were trying this service. So as a to sum up, it's really easy way how to interconnect any VPCs, uh, on-prem data centers, offices, uh, whatever you can imagine. You can even connect your laptop to it easily. So as there is like a little overview, how the UI looks like, uh, we will be mostly talking about our use case where we have three data centers or three regions, which is EU Central 1, US East 1, and AP Southeast 2. So basically kind of covering the whole world. Uh, so let's start with the building blocks. So uh, what do you need to build actual uh, cloud van? You need to first understand the difference between global network and core network. After you have that, you can create your own policies that will define how your core network is working. Then you need to define the segments. Uh, and for those segments, you need attachments. And all of it will be described later. And the last thing I would like to talk about is routing, because that's basically the magic that's happening inside. 
So global network, that's, you can imagine something like logical container for your network objects and network objects right now are like the core network, which I would describe more like Cloudman and transit gateways. You can actually interconnect these together. So that's what you need a global network for. You can have multiple of them. And the only limitation is one global network can contain only one core network. And the core network is actually that itself, the global network managed by AWS. So there's my, at least for me, there was kind of confusion about that because it's basically, you will see it once where you set it up and you will never see these terms again. You just have to click through them, but there is a bit of difference. So then there is the policy, which as I described is a single document or right, JSON, or they have a really nice UI for it describing regions, what regions you want to be in. Right now, I think all of the regions are supported. When we started, there was only eight of them. Uh, then you will define your segments. There you have to be kind of aware the limit is hard limit of 20 segments. So don't imagine it that you can go over segmentation, everything that you can put uh, like segments per region or whatever. So the limit is really 20 and it applies to the whole core network. Then you have the routing rules, which can define what is talking to what. As I described, it's the uh, MPLS with uh, IPVPN. So for those you know it, you can define, for example, a route leaking. Here it's called something like route sharing. You can say to do two segments that basically they can talk to each other or they cannot, or your attachments cannot talk to each other. Basically you can say anything to how you want the cloud van to behave. The last thing is that you of course want to kind of see where your attachments will go. For example, if you attach a VPC, how do you put it into a segment? I will show you later, but that's everything you say in policy. You are defining it, how the cloud van is behaving. And the really cool thing is everything is versioned. So if you edit something, you add a region, you modify, you delete a segment and the thing doesn't work. You don't have to go and look around. You can just like create, uh, select the previous version, hit rollback or restore in that case. And in 20 minutes, you are back where you started. So that's like really complete automation around the whole thing that's making it awesome if you compare with transit gateways and all that maze that was there before. So first, uh, as I described, you need the segments for network oriented people. It's something like virtual routing and forwarding, say domain. Uh, I made a little diagram here where you have the red uh, VPCs and blue VPCs. So as you kind of might notice is the red VPCs can talk to each other with no limits. There is nothing preventing the communication. But if the blue segment would like to talk to the red segment, cannot, it doesn't see it. Uh, you will not even see this route in the routing table for the blue segment. You have to somehow say by the policies that you want them to be able to talk to each other, or you have to do it somehow differently, which will, see later on. And as I mentioned, these attachments will be tagged. So for example, there will be tag, whatever you choose, for example, cloud one segment red, whatever VPC attachment you tag with that, it will end up in this segment. It's easy, it's really, it's super easy. Uh, there are the different types of attachment. The one most widely used is the VPC attachment. You can really, if you have ever seen the transit gateway attachment, it works completely the same. So you have the edge router, you will select which region you are connecting it to or where the VPC lives. And you just say, I'm attaching it to this one. You will tag it. It will automatically go to the segment or you can of course have a manual verification for security reasons. You can say for this segment, I don't want it attached automatically. Somebody has to click approve. So whatever you set in your policies, it will work. But then there is the second option, which is all the magic why we chose it. It's the connect attachment, which again, you might know from transit gateways, it's the GRE tunnel between your whatever routing appliance you have or virtual machine, whatever, and the cloud van edge router. Uh, so basically you can connect your routing appliance to that segment through GRE tunnel, which will completely cover whatever is under it. 
And of course, you can create multiple GRE tunnels. So you can segment, you can have segment A, segment B, segment C, segment D. And whatever is happening here, it's up to you, up to your routing appliance, firewalling, whatever. So as you have seen those two red and blue segments before, they couldn't talk to each other. But if you would connect your routing appliance here, red segment, blue segment, then whatever rule you will create here, it will work. Of course, you need to somehow make the routes visible. That's up to you how you make it. If it's BGP, static routing, whatever, I recommend BGP highly, but whatever you do, you control it by your routing appliance. There is nothing limiting you from what you can do, which is awesome. The last thing uh, I wanna mention is the site-to-site -site VPN attachment, which is providing, as you can kind of guess, IPsec to whatever location you have, laptop, whatever. Uh, there are no limitations for it, but you pay for it. So if you can have this, why to have this? I don't know, <laughs> but it's there. So the routing. Uh, routing is completely done in BGP, which is even like the eBGP, so external uh, BGP protocol. Uh, you can in your policy set something like a static route, but the static routing is saying just in this VPC, you can find whatever route you are directing it to, and it's all propagated to BGP as well. So again, you need BGP, so you cannot run away from it. Uh, only BGP metrics that are supported is the uh, AS path and multi-exit discriminator. The can be kind of issue when you want to control the traffic because if it's all mesh. So for example, if you have some routes you would prefer going one way or another, you have to do some really some dark magic with BGP, some prepending and stuff like that. And for failover, you really need to play with these parameters. But it just these two, you have no control of the BGP uh, inside. Uh, guys from Amazon, they actually said they are working on it. So I hope it will come soon, but Without it, it's sometimes it's kind of difficult and you really have to spend some time by the whiteboard to actually get what's going on and how it should be set up. And why I'm saying that? Because there is the issue of asymmetric routing. Uh, if you have just network equipment without any firewalling, you don't have to worry about asymmetric routing. But once you have a firewall in place and the packet will go one way and return other way, uh, the connection will never be made because the firewall is not seeing the complete handshake, TCP handshake, whatever. So basically the return information is coming from different way, the firewall will drop it. So you have to be really aware of that and set up your BGP to actually work kind of, it's ensuring symmetric routing. Here you have a little diagram, for example, you can see three regions uh all of them have different asn so it's ebgp uh and there are like one vpc connected vpc attachment whatever subnet is here is propagated automatically to bgp no issues and then there is the policy static route saying whatever route it's to this vpc inside of the vpc you have to adjust the routing table for it as well so it reaches whatever destination you need that's in the vpc and the static route is propagated again to the whole cloud van. So server here can send it through the static route that's just defined here. BGP will just automate it for you and it's awesome. So with all of that together, uh, you can imagine how you can uh, integrate the next generation of firewalls, which provide cool features. Uh, we'll talk about it a bit later, but just a quick overview, you place it in your VPC, you attach it to Cloud1 Edge Router, you do the GRE tunnel for every segment you have there, uh, and then whatever you need to interconnect, for example, your data center. Th this, is, this is free if you have it on your next gen firewalls. If you want to do it as a service with high availability done for you, you might use the side to side VPN attachment. Again, I'm completely up to you. And like the last use case we are using is the remote access VPN for users. So people can actually use it as VPN and with all the cloud van, we have it in every single region and it's like high availability out of box and it's, it's really cool. Uh, and then what's happening with your network, it's up to this box. You have the firewalling there. You have to have, of course, BGP. 
So all the routes we learned here will be learned by the next gen firewalls. Whatever routes you will send back to different segments, up to you. And there's even like some magic, I would call it, that we are using for the symmetric routing or asymmetric routing. Again, kind of like to make it clear without all the attachment mess and stuff, like there's the next gen firewall, you have two different segments and everything is done and solved on the next gen firewall. So you basically don't care about the underlying thing that's as a service, it's done for you, you don't have to care about it much. And of course, one thing that we are doing as well, it's providing the internet access. There is no internet gateway, no NAT uh, gateway, whatever in those segments. There's just default route going to the nearest uh, next gen firewall that will then send it to the internet doing all the IPS IDS stuff. And maybe even you can do SSL decryption if you want, which is like corporations want it more and more because today malware can create SSL certificate as well. So basically you, without that, you don't have any protection. So that's another thing you have out of box by just using that. So those BGP tricks I was mentioning uh, for every segment announce two things. The default route, if you are building something like DMZ and you want to use the internet gateways, you would not do that for that segment because you still want the internet going back to the whatever internet gateway there is. But if you don't want to do it, for example, you have a VPC with some kind of internal servers, whatever you, you can have, you can announce or you should announce both. This one is for updates, internet access, whatever. And this is for whatever internal network you have or like 172, uh, whatever routes you might have there. Uh, then one thing, if you are announcing only these routes there, you should create one segment that's done, that's doing only thing, only interconnecting those next gen firewalls. It's really great because you can control the traffic there very easy. You don't have to worry which way it will go, which segments the reply will go, because you are sure the, like the specific routes will be in this segment. So you just have to worry about, let's say, weight, local preferences, or whatever is in this transit, gate, uh, transit segment. Uh, and of course, this should be kind of properly designed to eliminate the asymmetric routing. So the rule we are using is that uh, every region should have its own firewall. If you have that, then whatever you need to cross the segment, you need to do, go to different region, it's easy. You have it like the local firewall says, okay, it's not my segment and it will send it through the transit. The reply will go, okay, again, not my segment sends it to, through the transit. There is no asymmetric routing at, at all. So that's something that really works for us well but it's kind of issue, there is one issue and that's the failover. It depends if you have like hey, availability of the appliances themselves in the each VPC, or you want to save some money, then you can have one uh, router or one firewall per VPC or per region. And the, but then it gets kind of tricky. We went this way, we have it working with one exception. Uh, it depends really on the appliance you are using. So you can have like the uh, AS prepending with multi-exit discriminator. Again, it's really BGP, pure BGP. So I don't expect, I guess, everybody to understand it completely. Or much better way, Cisco has it, that the conditional routes propagation. So you can have something like if this route is not present, for example, Lubeck route is not present in BGP, start announcing it or start announcing the routes you otherwise would not. So it really depends on the thing you have and you have to kind of come up with a solution. There is no, let's say, one universal solution for CloudVan yet. So as you see, if you put everything together, like we have the segments, like different one, if you want to talk from the red one to different region here, it, it gets there automatically. You, you don't have to go and do any firewalling. Uh, if you want to cross the segments, it will go through here, through the nearest firewall. If you would like to go to this segment, it will go to the firewall through the transit and here. The reply will go again this way, right here. So completely asymmetric routing is prevented. Uh, if you need to talk to the internet, it's again the closest firewall that will send you to the internet. 
and like you can imagine even connecting other servers, services, whatever. And like really, you have the BGP, you can play with the routing however you want. If you don't want to use firewalls, you like asymmetric routing, you do it different way, you can. Cloudvan is allowing you to do whatever you want, what you can do by BGP. So let's see the user interface. Uh, the user interface is something I really like about the service. Basically, whatever you create, whatever network you create, it's trying to visualize it for you. I actually had to turn off like the segmentation and everything because I would not be even able to do the screenshot of this. But for example, here you see the topology, every single region and all the VPCs or whatever attachments you have connected to it. So you have something like the topology and really this one is not that simple because I had to turn off the segmentation, but you kind of get the idea what you can get out of it. Then this one is uh, really useful is the logical graph with the filters. So for example, you are trying to find which VPCs are connected to my, let's say IT internal segment. You just, okay, you set it here and it will just show up like that. You can even click these and you will see the details where it is, uh, how it's connected, whatever. You know, it's really providing all the information for you to troubleshoot. Uh, again, you have some legend here and you can even see if you have any attachments that are not attached anywhere, because that's something that might happen quite often. If you share Cloudvan to your organization, somebody will just create an attachment and you don't know about it. You have to approve it, of course, but it will be somewhere here like, hey, nobody is attached this anywhere. Maybe you can take a look at it. Uh, another cool feature is the metrics and the graphing of it. Again, you have a little filter here. You can select your region you want to see, uh, some dates, whatever, and you see the utilization. Of course, like it's much more graphs, but I wouldn't make that small screenshot. So you can see all the metrics you need. Uh, for example, you are hunting for some issue with throughput, whatever, something like this one, like why is happening? I don't know, but you know, the time frame. then you can open the logs from your next can firewall appliances and actually find the traffic. So it helps a lot if you encounter any performance issues or something like that. Then routing. Uh, of course, if you have like hundreds and hundreds of routes, you need to somehow troubleshoot it. Why is this going this direction? Why it's going that direction, whatever. Uh, this tool is helping you the most. Basically, you select your segment, then your location, and you hit search routes. As I use the BGP tricks I was mentioning, basically what you see here is the default route that's going to your connect peer, connect attachment peer, and the same for this route. So you know these two routes will go to your next gen firewall. Then you have these two routes, this one, which is saying VPC, that means there is a VPC connected to this region. So you have the direct way there, nothing in the between. And then you have this route, which is saying it's in the US East one region, so, meaning that whatever comes to this region in this segment, it will be sent directly to different region, no firewalling done in place. Of course, if I would switch to the transit segment, you would have like multiple and multiple pages of these routes. That's where it's the most useful. Here's just an example how you see different types of routes. And the last thing I wanna emphasize in the UI is the events. Basically, sometimes you're just hunting, why is this route not being in the routing table? You don't know, like what's happening? So you want to see these events. For example, there is a BGP established and then you see three routes in uh, segments have been established. If you click it, you see complete information from the ASN numbers, AS pass, all the parameters. So you can, for example, see there is a routing loop or something like that. So you, you can use this to troubleshoot it. Of course, it's CloudVouch, so kind of tricky to search through it, but doable, perfectly doable. Okay, so... Let's go to the CloudVan deployment, which is really easy how to start with. The like most popular way, I guess, for beginners is the ClickOps, that you can easily click it and you will have the result within minutes. Well, you have to wait like 40 minutes for that thing to deploy first time, but 
you get it. Uh, then you have everything as I was describing before, the policy is actually a JSON document. So you can create, just name it, just create your core network, global networks, and then just paste a JSON, it's done. It will be uh, trans transformed, va validated, and everything fits, it's created. Then you can, of course, have CloudFormation and Terraform. When we started with it, these two options were not available, so I'm most familiar with the ClickOps. But now, these days, you can do this easily, and there's no issue with that. So how to create your brand new network? You open something that's called Network Manager. I guess you are all familiar with it already. Uh, and you create that global network, which is that high-level container. After you have that, uh, there is like this big button, <laughs> and there is a something like a wizard that will just let you name it. That's what you need. You just name a global network. Then the step two is optional, but why not do it? It's to actually create that core network. After you create that, it will ask you to create your first policy that will describe all the important parts. You have to define the ASN ranges for the BGP. So, and it needs to be from the private range. So you just define, let's say 64,500 uh, to 64,600, and that's it. Like that's, I think, even the only uh, mandatory thing to do, except like regions or whatever. Uh, if you are using those attach, uh, attachment of type of connect, you have to define whatever subnet you are using. And just be careful, you have to then define every single region with subnet from this bigger uh, block so it should be quite a it should be big <laughs> it should not be just slash 24. Uh, important part is choose your regions if you choose your regions wrong or whatever it might cost you more money for no reasons or you can actually have to recreate it and like this is the most time consuming part if you change the regions it might take again 30, 40 minutes to apply. So you want to get this one right at the first time. You can, of course, add, remove, whatever you need. Uh, then you define your segments and all of that attachment acceptance, what I was describing before, with all those attachment policies. So if you need to attach something automatically, for example, you have a Terraform that's creating VPCs, you need to attach them immediately without any approval. You can set it this way that nobody will approve that thing. or other way, you have some kind of security segment, some segment where no one should be allowed access or something that easy, then you will select the manual, manual approval. Then after somebody creates a VPC, says, okay, I want to attach it to this segment, it will light up in your console and until you click accept or deny, uh, it's not going anywhere. After you create it, just apply it, which like you will see here, like your version one, there will be this button after uh, some seconds enabled because there is verification before it enables you to apply it and then just apply it. It takes for the first time like 40, 45 minutes and you will be left with the global network cloud van created. After, of course, some time you need to do some adjustments. As you see, we are starting with this one in March, <laughs> but then after we were okay with it, like if you need to add segment, once every three months or something, you are not doing many changes after it. it. For you, it's as a service, you have the everything you need and you are taking care of the whatever you are building on top of it. You are basically not touching that at all. Uh, of course, if you do something wrong, you want to roll it back. You just select the previous version, you hit restore and you are in previous stage. The pricing is one of the, I would say, cons. Uh, there is hour, hourly rate, but I converted per month because like the hourly rate is not saying much. So uh, every region you have your segment uh, and your uh, region, your edge, it's costing $366 per month, which can kind of sound like a lot. But for us, for example, that means we don't have to have an IT team there. That means we can actually easily deploy a data center with all the services without anyone in the region at all. We just create this router that's as a service and we can do whatever automation we have all over the world without any IT team present. So 
not that expensive after all. Then, of course, one thing that's kind of worth considering is the rate per attachment. It varies per region, so you have to actually open the price list uh, to see, but it's around $40 a month per attachment. So per every VPC attached, you pay $40, which kind of, you don't want to go the way that I have one service, I create VPC for it. I have another service, I create VPC for it. Of course, if you, you have a lot of money, then go that way, but usually then there's somebody coming to you saying you have to save money. Uh, the last thing you have to pay is the data transfers. So that's, I guess you are used to it already that varies where is the source, where is the target. So I kind of really simplified it a lot. So it's around $20 per one terabyte if you stay inside AWS. Of course, it's less if you stay within a region. It's more if you transfer to uh, US, whatever. And then it's $90 per one terabyte to the internet. So the VPN, uh, remote access VPN for users we have, that's kind of pricey. But again, like we, the other way is again, using some cloud service, which we had, it was horrible. So we build it ourselves with this price and users are not watching that much for though. <laughs> so it's not that bad. So uh, last uh, block I have is our way to the cloud van, why we went that way and what were the issues we were trying to solve. So like the thing we were starting with before COVID was actually our own and our data center. It's right over there. Uh, so as you can agree, that's not a data center. And of course, there were a lot of issues. It was getting out of support. So a lot of things you have to handle and you have no one to yell at. So let's move to the cloud. We can at least yell at the cloud or the support. So that was kind of the main drive, main motivation because our team started to be scattered all around the world. And if you start build a team in Australia and you have your VPN, you have your servers here in Prague, not work much because the latency there is like 300, 400 milliseconds. That's like not working that much. So what are your options? You can start, you can hire a RIT team in Australia, build a data center, find some local like cloud provider or something. That's, and you're just solving Australia. Then we were in uh, Toronto, in Canada. We have the same problem in London, South America. So that would not scale that much. So that was one of the parts you are trying to solve with that. And CloudVan is actually delivering it very, very well. Uh, another thing that we need to replace was different technologies. Like whatever was in Canada was different from whatever was here. Uh, you have to connect it to each other. Uh, people were just bringing their computers, setting up services and they connected to the local network and they were saying, oh, I cannot reach the database server in Karlin. And of course you cannot because it's not even interconnected. Uh, with the cloud coming, then everybody had like, their own account, they set up some services, they again wanted to interconnect with something. Uh, and then the security department started to be really worried how it's going. So there was really great, complete mess. Uh, so we decided to go in some really organized way. We need one backbone, one infrastructure that will like interconnect everything in a secure and scalable way. Uh, one thing that was really blocking us was the chip shortage because all the equipment here we had was out of support, was not able to do uh, things really securely. The identity firewalling we wanted to provide for the whole infrastructure, we actually had to wait for the devices to arrive. So it was over a year before it all arrived. So another issue we had why we got delayed quite much. And the last thing we had, if you have server room here in Karlin, which is famous for flooding, you have really limited high availability. If this goes down, like what you're gonna do? You like have to build it somewhere else? I don't know. So how did we solve it? We decided as I described to skip creation of our own on-prem infrastructure. Just didn't make sense. Like I, we didn't want to do it in Australia. Maybe somebody would like to go there, but you know, you have a failed drive, you fly over or what? So 
that was definitely a no-go for us. So we were trying to find some cloud solution. Even we considered something like local cloud providers, but then if you look at the cost, counting all of that together, the AWS costs are not that high. If you compare, if you want to have some reliable connection between uh, continents, the traffic transfer uh, rate is not that high because uh, like if you have ever seen some quote for intercontinent connections of public fiber with some uh, guaranteed parameters, AWS is cheap. So uh, we had a really nice project ongoing. We, didn't, we started something like September, 2021. And so there was no cloud van at that time. So the first thing we, with our consultants came up with was that transit gateway interconnected together, which was not really great, but at least there was no other way, basically. And then in December, 2021, on the reInvent, there was the cloud van announcement. Like in January, we had it on it. Like we, we knew we want to go that way because that was amazing. It solved all of those issues with complexity and all the automation. We just went through it, even if it was in the preview. It was a risk, but now it's like generally available and the technology, I think it's really going forward. Great. There will be a lot of new features coming. So what I was describing today might not be true in a year or two. Right now, we ended up with three regions, 11 different segments. Uh, so it's not that expensive after all. Uh, all of our offices are connected uh, to the cloud van via those firewalls I was mentioning you were waiting for. Uh, and really, all of our IT services is connected via cloud van. The APUC on top of you, it's like controlled by the cloud van connected service. So basically, we have like even the DNS, it's RAP53 as a service with all the um, delegation of forwarders. Everything is done through CloudVan. It's super easy. You know that you have a forwarder. You have to forward your DNS request for some domain to your old on-prem infrastructure. You just put the IP there. Done. If you have firewall rules in, pl in place, it will find its way. You don't have to take care of it. Then we have the Cisco VLC. Uh, we even use the Cisco DNA for controlling the Cisco VLC, but that's hosted in uh, one of our providers' data centers. Again, we connect it to uh, a cloud van. We don't have to care about it at all. We created secondary VLC in, uh, uh, in US to control our North American offices. It's working. We really don't have to care about much. Then, of course, the security requirements, it was like the logging solution. Active Directory to manage everything, site to site to partners, backups, firewall management, whatever you can imagine you would have in your data center, we moved it to AWS. So the network security part, we have the Palo Alto Nest generation firewalls between segments, which are providing the internet access, so you need to secure it. It's providing the VPN for users, uh, site to site to offices, whatever you can imagine. But of course, from the security part, we have all the IPS, IDS, threat prevention, DNS security. So for example, if there is a known phishing on some domain, you can block the domain. And all of that for all your users, but even all your AWS infrastructure, which is awesome. Uh, then there is the identity firewalling. I don't know if everybody knows what it is. So basically you are not creating firewall rules anymore based like this IP address can reach this IP address. You are just saying, for example, Joe can reach this IP address as a target. But who is Joe? You don't care. You have Azure AD. Azure AD will tell you this is Joe. And there is like Palo Alto, next generation firewalls, cloud identity engine that is actually can do it independent. Who is the provider of the uh, data? No, you don't care. You just use the identity engine and you set it up even multi via multiple directories like Google, who is Google, you can have it. So, and another cool thing is that you don't even need to say it's Joe, but it's Joe's department. So for example, you said finance can reach this server on port 80443. And who is given access? You don't care. Whoever is in that Azure AD group is given access. You don't even have to manage it. You don't even have to open the firewall to add anyone access, which is really for having this in the cloud, it's, it's really awesome. 
And thanks to this, really on-prem Active Directory will soon be obsolete. We really need it for some use cases, but I, I think we could live without it easily. Uh, there is one thing you have to still worry about. It's the communication within the segment, which is still relying on security groups because it's not going between the segments. So there is no firewall in place. So you still need to worry about it. So the way we went through it, it's we enabled the flow logs and we have a tool called Prisma Cloud. I have a screenshot later, which is providing at least alerting. If something is happening, there is, you will know about it. You can dig through the flow logs very easily through this tool and you can see when, by whom is it happening. You will have the source IP, target IP, and then you can go back to your Palo Alto and see what it, who that was at that time, thanks to the identities. The visibility, as I mentioned, all the logging goes to our one tool. So you can then do any dashboards you imagine. I just did this easy one uh, for, for this because it's not containing many information. And whatever you can do with it, you have, uh, if you log every single connection, you can then open the log and see why is this guy was connecting to all the printers. Is it the malware or whatever? Then if something was flagged by your threat things, you can see where the computer was connecting. So you have all the information in one place, which we were really struggling before to get in the cloud or even on-prem services. Uh, and this is the tool I was saying, the, the Prisma Cloud, for example, I did just quick a demo from one account and just like remove the name of it. And you see, like all the communication, it was done in last 24 hours. And in every single line, if you click it, you will get this amount of information. And if you click view details, you will get all the IPs, source, targets, everything. So that's something we had to add to the portfolio, security portfolio to be able to secure properly, even like the communication inside of the segment. Of course, you can install whatever agents within the segment, like I don't know, XDR, or some traps, whatever, uh, honeypots, what, whatever you can imagine, you can have it there and it will help you to secure the inside of the segment, I think. Uh, so there is one thing, the last thing I have is the high availability, how we solve that. So for the demo purposes, uh, it's just simplified uh, cloud one with two regions, US, uh, Europe, and we are connecting through to this server, just simple ping. And from the server, we have open serial console that's showing how it gets to the internet. So that's the thing you will see there. And in the middle, uh, we just kill this firewall and we will see how long it takes before all the traffic is rerouted through here, like 6,000 kilometers, even maybe more different. And we are watching it from this segment are like this remote user VPN. So that's one thing I had to do because if I would be here, I would completely drop out. So you will not see the VPN failover, but. <laughs> so here you see the uh, console. Um, there is simple script that's just doing ping to 888. You see the latency, it's just around 3.39 milliseconds. And you see your public IP, where is it uh, terminating? Then here, there is a ping to that actual next gen firewall that we will kill. I actually killed it before, but it takes like one minute for it to shut down. So I just cut the video, so here. And then you have the ping from my machine to that server. So you see here, it already started to time out. Here the IP change, you have rerouted through Europe, you have 95.9 milliseconds and we lost like I think four pings, yeah. And there you go, it's back. High availability done across, uh, across uh, regions and like 6,000 kilometers apart. Okay, so that was the last thing.